and challenges that we are facing in B-Schools today. And I'm starting with a great article by Al Kingsley. This was in, uh, with the Forbes Technology Council. And one of the big changes that we're seeing is that we used to talk about ed tech as uh, an, a topic, and we would talk around it and about it. And now it really is an integral part of every school day. So it's no longer just theory, it's we have to be applying it, not only teaching students how to do it, but we have to be using it ourselves every day as well. But he makes a really important point that we don't need to force it into everything. You know, we only should have it where it's appropriate. And I think when we started into this, um, even 10 years ago, there was this sense of, oh, I have to have every assignment or every day has to have a certain part of technology into it. And we realized that's not necessarily true. There, there is a balance in, in how we teach and what we teach. And the other important point that he makes is that we've learned that we need to have IT managers involved in every step of this. Um, I know one of the schools I was working with as president, we were uh, putting in a new student learning system and we had to have the, all of the IT people, all of the marketing people, all of our admissions people, because there's so many different pieces that have to fit together when we make these changes. Um, the accounting people needed to know that payments would come through. We needed to know that students um, could access it as well as parents and that admissions people could put in their notes. And if the IT managers weren't there at the very beginning to know, first of all, what was our purpose, um, what was our goal with it, and then second of all, to be able to look at it and say, okay, here's what we need to have as a foundation first. You can't just purchase all this software and expect that it's gonna be up and running right away. Um, looking at uh, David Rowe's article on six digital transformation challenges, he, he expands upon this. And he says, one of the problems as I was just mentioning is that we often start out kind of blind. We just say, well, we need to catch up to everyone else, or we know we need to have all these courses move to online, and we don't really do the research first. We don't think about what it is that our customer's journey, our student's journey is going to be. And when I talk about customers, it's not just our students. As I mentioned, it's, it's parents who are needing access. It is our staff. It is our faculty. So it's making sure to take at least a moment to step back before we go through any great advancement on the technology front and make sure we're thinking about um, the needs of everyone who's gonna be touching that. Secondly, um, we can get caught up in the short-term planning and there can be a lot of fatigue. I've been through this in um, two different schools where there's so much upfront in the training and in purchasing it and researching it that by the time you're getting to implement it, everyone's just tired. <laughs> So um, what we had to do was uh, balance very carefully that if I needed admissions and marketing and all of that, we had certain people involved in the beginning phases. We had other people who stepped in for the implementation and yet a third group that would step in for a lot of the testing. So it's um, being aware of that and knowing that this is not just a short-term project where we get it up and running and then we're done. Um, this is ongoing training and ongoing upgrades and everything else. The next one he talks about really, we all face this in any organizational change. Um, we have to change the culture. Um, I had faculty members who just were absolutely against teaching online. Um, I had some who fully embraced it and created great programs with videos and links and everything else. I had another faculty who said, well, when I'm in the classroom, I always show my PowerPoints and talk about them. So I'm just gonna upload all my PowerPoints online. Um, so it was, it was getting that culture change to accept that this was kind of the new normal. Um, and this was before COVID. We're talking about 10, 15 years ago trying to make this happen. So we had the time to be able to do it as opposed to the last couple of years where many of us just had to jump in and, and make it happen. Um, I already talked about aligning the business challenge with the IT challenge. Of course, um, we're in this to be able to continue our businesses. Um, and so we need to serve our customers while also being mindful of the budget, but then IT requires um, that we invest in that and there can be a lot of infrastructure in it. And of course, there's always a lot of fear around any change like this, but especially with IT. So as I mentioned, the technology integration means we have to have training and it's ongoing training. Um, we don't do one time showing everyone how the new system works and then assume they're going to be able to use it and use all the tools in it. Um, and the last piece really is important for all of us because 
we tend to think about the infrastructure and what we need. Do we need to have laptops for all the students or do we need to have servers or are we doing it in the cloud? But the other piece of that is there's a huge security issue now because it's no longer just accessing something on the campus where we have more control over it. Now, as I said, we may have parents coming into a portal online to get information and students coming from all over the globe. So we need to be mindful of what does it take to protect that data as well. So Sloan Management Review had a, a great article and it was interesting that um, virtually 100% of workers say that being digitally savvy is absolutely essential in what they do. And I think we all know that in, in teaching in business schools that we need to have our students coming out prepared. What was also interesting is that a lot of them focused on their leadership being digitally savvy. And I know a lot of you out there work with um, business professionals who are in the workforce coming back to get additional training or degrees. And this is really key when we talk about leadership because um, a lot of the students are going out there and saying, I know how to use all of this because I learned it, but the people above me don't understand as well as I do how it works. And it can be very frustrating for them. And we're all having to deal with more than just the business of, of school or just the academics or whatever our department is. It, it's all integrated now. So we're constantly having to think about IT, communications, budgeting, and then even much bigger pictures um, social justice issues, sustainability, equality. Um, I know in a local school district here where my wife works, um, it's a very socioeconomic, uh, economically challenged area. And they felt like they were way ahead when COVID hit because in the school, every student had their own um, iPad. And so they thought, well, this is easy. We're gonna, we're gonna shift to at home. We're just gonna tell them all to take their iPads home and we're way ahead of the curve. Well, of course, a lot of the students didn't have internet access in their homes. Um, they had parents who didn't know how to help them if there was an issue with their iPads. So they had to look at, from an equality standpoint, um, the fact that not all students had the same tools when they got home. And they were, they were very forward thinking. They, they reached out to different um, internet providers. They found ways to set up hotspots, even mobile hotspots where they would go to neighborhoods and it would be there for a couple hours and the students could access it. Um, but it's, it's really thinking about all of that as a leader that goes far beyond what, what we've had to do in the past. The next one here, we're all facing this, that blurring of line between home and work. Um, when, my, when my home office is my work, um, how, do I, how do I separate those two? And I'm sure that we've all been in the situation where we have an email at night and we think, oh, I'm just going to go answer that at seven o'clock at night. And then at 1030, we realize we're still sitting on our computer doing work. So appreciating that for our staff um, and understanding that, you know, sometimes we're not going to respond within um, 20 minutes to an email that may be sent uh, at nine o'clock at night. I do love this next part about an idea for organizations to have mentoring programs. And again, this isn't just about mentoring new employees. This is about mentoring leaders. So um, having leaders understand what the, uh, the new technology is, what the new way that we're connecting, and having mentors to help them. Because only 19% of the people surveyed said their organization has something in place for leadership as opposed to for staff and faculty. The last part is from the um, Bloomberg article that I have noted at the top. And by the way, all of these are, um, the citations for all of these are on the last slide if you want them. So they noted that uh, MBA grads, we used to sort of say, well, you need to understand this. So when you get into the workplace, you'll be able to apply it. Well, now the expectation is we don't want them to just be able to apply it. We want them to be able to step right in and handle broad scale digital transformation. Um, which is a huge shift. That is uh, something that is putting a much greater demand on B-schools to be able to say, yes, we're not only training them about these things, um, we're training them to come in and be ready to use them and to have some working knowledge of them, whether it's Slack or Basecamp or many of the others. So some of the things that, that we offer here at IACBE that focus on these, of course, we're, in, we're looking at outcomes-based um, education. So it's 
are students uh, able to actually demonstrate what it is that you've said are your goals based on your mission? So we're not highly prescriptive. Um, we look at what it is that you want to do with your school, whether it's professional training more than academic, um, and, and we help you look at how you can measure those things. And we also, through our faculty qualifications, you know, it's not just about having a degree anymore. Um, we're looking at what additional training or what certificates that faculty may have. Um, if they have 20 years of experience in something, that can take the place of the degree because that's actually what is needed more. And a lot of our schools in India are very focused on having um, professionals who are in the business doing the teaching as opposed to someone who might have the academic credentials. So we certainly recognize that. We also encourage collaboration with external education providers. This could be having a, a business advisory council, it could be through internships, it could be partnerships with businesses or even guest speakers. Um, conferences like this one might be a part of that. And then lastly, um, of course, we serve as an, an objective outside partner to help in the improvement process and to say, here's what we're seeing other schools do. Here are some tools we have in our member resource area and providing those to be of help. So essentially, you know, this is your evidence of quality as with um, any time that you go for an accreditation. Um, it's an outside validation that you have for students and parents and, and businesses that are working with you. Lots of ways to share best practices. Of course, um, I mentioned earlier, we have the annual conference coming up in April in Costa Mesa, California. We have all of the regional conferences. We have our monthly online forums that are free to everyone and other webinars that we also do in partnership with people like Peregrine and CapSource and some of those. And lastly, you know, we provide that public accountability. Um, just as we ask all of you to go through the accreditation process, we also go through an accreditation process and have our outside people at Chia looking at what we're doing to assure that we're being transparent and providing what we say we should. So I'm not gonna go through all these key learning outcomes, um, just to know that we do have seven, seven key areas where we um, ask every school to substantially address these in some way. And you can see it's different, whether it's an associate degree or a master's or wherever that may be. But I think the key one for today's discussion is number six, looking at um, analyzing uh, technology and how that's being utilized. And you can see again, through each degree, there is a higher expectation of how that's being done. But as part of your self-study year, looking at this digital transformation world and the tools that are available, um, we're there to help you see how you're doing it now, how it's being measured, and what ways that that can be improved. Um, really quickly now, I just because I want to honor the time and make sure Alima gets um, in for her presentation, there are three steps to our process, educational, candidate, and um, fully accredited. You can see there's no fee to join as an educational member. You do not have to be um, accredited elsewhere to become an educational member. Um, it's simply paying the dues that gives you full access to all of our resources and discounts on all of our programs. Um, candidacy, you'll see there's a, an accreditation institute you take. This is where we spend a day and a half going through all of the accreditation process with you, making sure you understand every form that you're gonna to have to fill out, know what the expectations are when there's a site visit that comes to your school, um, every step of the way, um, having your questions answered and being fully prepared for that. Um, last part, of course, is going for full accreditation. And all of this is on our website, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here. I've just listed some of the fees and expectations. You'll see that you will have two team members come to your school for a visit. Those are always members uh, from our member schools, and they have been trained as site visitors. And we always work to have at least one of those members be from a school very similar to yours, so they understand your situation, and you're not having some big state research school coming to a small faith-based school and expecting the same um, kind of outcomes. And you'll see that right now we are doing our visits virtually, uh, but we will be opening back up to um, physical visits uh, in the next year here. Again, not gonna go through every one of these steps because this is all on the website, but the process generally takes um, 28 to 36 months for most schools to go through it. Um, you can see on this map that it can be done in as little as two years. It just means having the timing exactly right for when you join, getting to an accreditation institute, 
and having everything fall into place and assuming that the board of commissioners approves your candidacy and you can go right into first time accreditation. But again, most schools are gonna be 28 to 36 months. The cost, um, you can see here, it is spread out over three years, roughly $13,000 depending on um, the cost of travel. That is included in that $13,000 figure that I gave there. So that's even if we have to send someone flying from the US to India, and then we always try to find someone more local um, to be the second team member so that expense is lower. Um, but that will affect the overall cost of this. And again, if you condense this into two years, obviously that, that total amount isn't gonna change, but each year will. Um, lastly, wanna talk about um, some of our partners. Um, Jordan Levy at CapSource runs our student competition. And if you haven't had a chance to be a part of that, I know we did have, I think, Ames Institutes and Induce and Holy Angel. Um, those were all part of this fall's competition with Genuino. If you want to talk about something that absolutely fits in with today's topic, uh, Genuino is a blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, non-fungible token company. So students are right in the thick of it um, with the student competition this fall. Uh, next Friday, we'll be having a webinar announcing the winners of that one and also talking about the competition for the spring, which will culminate at the annual conference in Costa Mesa again in April. Um, that will also be with Genuino. It'll be a different um, approach to it. So if you have students interested in that, again, it's open to members or non-members. And if you don't have a full team of four students, um, individual students can become a part of that and they will be placed on a team with others. So a lot of different ways to participate with that. Um, we all know Peregrine Global Services and the great work that they do. They have been a partner with us for years and one of our sponsors. Um, we appreciate all the support that they give us. And of course, um, we are very familiar with all of their um, testing methods and what people are using to make sure that they're reaching their outcomes. Um, it is not the only one, but we certainly appreciate um, the work that they do in tailoring a lot of that to make sure that our schools um, are testing exactly to their outcomes and the great work that they do there. Dr. Christian Guild is the editor of our Journal for Advancing Business Education. If you are looking to um, be published in a peer-reviewed journal, this is a great way to do it. And if you're looking for um, an opportunity to get additional research for something you may be doing, I encourage you to go under our website under the news section and take a look at the past journals that are out there. Um, obviously, with all of this, we've had to go virtual too. <clears throat> our accreditation institutes have been offered virtually. I mentioned we have our monthly forums. The next one will be in December with Jordan Levy from CapSource. So I invite you to um, take a look at that under our events drop down on the website. We do have a lot of member resources. That's everything from um, rubrics that you may need to forms to connections with other um, schools. And you can see there in the past, we've had student competitions with DoorDash, CoinSource, um, a lot of great companies. And then of course, our annual and regional conferences. <clears throat> and we are working on the regional conference um, for the Asian region to be in February. So please be watching for that. We'll have announcements coming out on that very soon as well. I did mention lastly that um, we hope you all can join us in sunny California, April 4th through the 8th, 2022. <clears throat> and again, thank you to our many sponsors. Peregrine has always been supportive of us and um, applies direct sponsorship for the uh, annual conference. <clears throat> CapSource, of course, will be running the student competition. And then we have interpretive simulations and Caps, uh, CapSim as exhibitors. And special thanks to IMA who um, promotes our Accounting Business Faculty of the Year Award, and we appreciate that from them. So that is it in my 20 minutes and 52 seconds. I almost made it. <laughs> so any questions that anyone has, I'd be glad to answer. And you can see here um, the listing of the sources um, that I spoke about in here. So Tatari, thank you. Tatari, sorry, thank you so much for um, the opportunity to, to be a part of this, and I'll be glad to answer any questions anyone may have. You're welcome, uh, Ted. It was a, it's a phenomenal presentation as usual. Uh, the very idea that our, our own advocacy uh, should include all the accreditation systems, uh, we are always vindicated by that because this is the one of the best play ways in which uh, the schools can get to choose whom to go with or to go with everyone, whatever is the choice that people may have. 
So it's an amazing thing. So thank you so much, uh, Dave. It's a continuing uh, uh, relationship and this will definitely be there uh, next year too. And we'll continue.